Tom Quay presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hello everyone, it's Tom Quay here, back with another edition of The Royal Ramble. I hope you're well, I hope you've had your teas, I hope you're back from Darren's, etc, etc. If you're not familiar with the podcast, this is me, as I mentioned, my name's Tom Quay, and I am, like I'm sure you are if you're listening, an absolute fanatic about the Royal Family. I truly think it is one of the greatest pieces of television of all time. You know, I'm putting it up there with The Simpsons, with The Sopranos, with The Wire. I just started watching NYPD Blue for the first time, which a lot of people mention as a kind of uh, landmark of televisual quality. I'm putting it up there with NYPD Blue as well, with Sipowitz, with David Kelly, with Nick Totoro, with all those guys. But, um... Enough gabbering on. You know, today we are talking about one of the most beloved episodes of the show, that being Decorating, Season 3's Decorating. And just before we get to Decorating, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do. So, of course, if you enjoy the show, you want to give back to the show, there's many ways you can do that. The first way is probably the best way. You can just tell a friend. If you're mad on the Royal Family like I am, just let a friend know about this show spread the word that way, organic growth, etc. Also, we are on all the social platforms, Raw Ramble Pod on Twitter. All these links will be down below. iTunes, if you enjoy, you can leave us a review on iTunes or on Spotify, YouTube, wherever your RSS feed takes you. That's basically where we're going to be housed. And yeah, you can also get in touch with the show at the Raw Ramble Pod at gmail.com. I've got two great emails to get into. And if you really, really love the show, you can help support us on Patreon. So basically what that is, is a way of keeping the lights on over here and what I do is whatever episode comes out on the main feed the free feed you know the iTunes the RSS feed we're always a month ahead on Patreon so in terms of today we're going to be getting into decorating but uh, of course Elsie's funeral is now on the Patreon as well and that will be coming out next month and then we'll have the episode about Anthony going to London and etc etc so yeah it's essentially premium access we put the quiz episodes on there as well and various other little video projects that I work I'm relating to the show but it's not expected of course I'm sure a lot of you are like me tighter than a camel's ass in a sandstorm so I do really appreciate everyone that supports over there especially so just before we jump into the day's analysis of decorating let's get into the emails So our first email comes from Sam Quinn. He says, good evening. I hope this email finds you well. Just wondering what you've had for your tea. I just found your podcast and have been binge listening to them and absolutely love them all. The Royal Family is one of my favourite shows of all time and I regularly will throw on an episode whenever I have some free time. I grew up in Rotherham, England and started watching the show when I was 10 in 1998. Me and my mum watched it together and it was always a show close to our hearts. We moved to Canada in 2004, and one of the cherished possessions that I brought with me was my Royal Family DVDs. Fast forward to 2018, and I was lucky enough to marry the love of my life, Amber. She grew up in Canada, and I've tried to show her the Royal Family, and while she tries, the cultural references are often confusing if you didn't grow up in England. Anyway, me and my mum were trying to decide what our first dance at my wedding was going to be, and there weren't any songs we could think of. Until mom suggested we do Mambo number five. Spatulas and all, dancing like Jim and Twiggy, pretending to strip the wallpaper without a steamer. Fifteen pound a bloody day. As you can imagine, in a room full of mostly Canadians, seeing two people dancing around to Mambo number five, pretending to strip wallpaper, must have been very confusing. Thank goodness for the open bar. However, it is one of my most cherished memories of the day, and I wouldn't change it for the world. And I've attached a video for you to see. Take care and make my bacon dead, dead crispy, Sam. Well, Sam, thanks so much for getting in touch as always, all the way over from Canada via Rotherham. And yes, I can attest, dear listeners, this video is incredible. So Sam sent a copy of this video and it is just hilarious and heartwarming. And yeah, you can sort of see a lot of the Canadians not getting it at all. But then everyone just sort of joins on the dance floor and it becomes this whole hullabaloo unto itself to Mambo number five. But I mean, (laughs) I just like when Sam sent this email and sent this video, I couldn't download it fast enough. Like just inspired, really. And maybe I might steal that in the future if ever I were to get wed, to be honest with you. And also, Sam, it's funny what you mentioned about the references as well. Because I found that it's a very acquired taste. I know I've said this a few times on the show, but I do think, I struggle to think of any show that's as American as Royal Family is British, if that makes sense. That's not to say that there aren't, you know, lots of American sort of stuff out there, but... I don't know, there's just something about a show that will mention Argos and, you know, 
pudding chips and gravy and stuff. I, I don't know. It just it just all feels very of a type, and I think that just adds to the show. So um, yeah, Sam, thanks for getting in touch. And our second email, this is sort of a crossover of sorts, actually. We're looking into the multiverse of madness, if you will. So so as I've said on the show a few times, uh, you know, I've done a few podcasts. This is, I think, my fifth or sixth podcast that I've actually done. So I'm pretty addicted to the form. Yeah, but one of the projects that I'm most proud of was called Alpha Metallica. I mean, it still kind of exists, but I don't really post that regularly. So I'm a giant Metallica fan, giant music fan in general. And basically, Alpha Metallica was me going through the entire back catalogue of Metallica in alphabetical order and just doing a song per episode with a guest and I think I had about guests from around 34 countries from around the world in the end and it was about 160 odd songs so you know it was a proper world tour proper historical kind of jaunt so if you're down with Metallica or indeed if you just like hearing this old chap talk about things and you think well Tom's all right let's see what he thinks about Ride the Lightning whatever that may mean then go and seek that out but yeah I mentioned the crossover because someone that I had on the show a few times Luke actually got in touch with me the other day and you know out of the blue like me and Luke done a few episodes I'm familiar with the guy good guy but uh but yeah he listens to the Raw Ramble pod and here's his email he says hi Tom hey how you doing it's Luke who guested on Alpha Metallica a few times long time no speak I only just heard about this podcast and I had to check it out as I love the Raw family and have enjoyed your other podcasting work I've listened to all of the podcast episodes discussing the first season this week and plan to fully catch up before the next one drops in fact I'm listening to the pregnancy episode right now while I write this email on the bus My first memory of the show was seeing the new sofa on Christmas Day, aged nine years old. Most of the jokes went over my head, but I liked how much it made my dad laugh. I didn't really return to the show until my late teenage years when I became a fan instantly, and it remains in my top ten lists of comedy shows to this day. And although I agree that the specials don't have the same feel as the far superior original run, I still return to the new sofa every Christmas to get me in the festive spirit. I can't pick a favourite episode, but every scene with Nana is a highlight. Her list of what she drinks on what occasion is probably my favourite line in the whole show. Looking forward to hearing the rest of the episodes. Best wishes, Luke. And Luke, great to hear from you. I mean, me and Luke covered a few things on the podcast. We spoke about a song called Devil's Dance by Metallica, um, a Kerrang! cover album of their legendary 86 Master of Puppets album, and also a time when their drummer, the legendary Dane Lars Ulrich, went on to the, well, he deigned Who Wants a Millionaire and guested on that show, and he was actually quite good, so we discussed that episode as well. But, um, yeah, it's funny because Luke's a little bit younger than me, as you can probably tell from that email. So he was nine when New Sofa came out, so I'm about 10 years older than Luke. So, you know, when I was around, that age I remember watching the um, original Roger Christmas special the one from 2000 so you know these kind of generational differences are really interesting because yeah I don't really hold any of your specials close to my heart but I suppose if I grew up them I definitely would and you know again it's mixed feelings for me going forward now because we're almost at the end of the run of the show really we're almost done with season three then we've got Queen well then we've got the Christmas special then we've got Queen of Sheba and then we have these specials themselves you know which okay probably going to be fun to pick apart but it's more fun to just celebrate the genius of this show isn't it more than anything but no no no, luke thanks for the email and enjoy checking out my thoughts on series two and beyond and maybe we'll get luke on the show for a quiz episode or something like that in the future but yeah let's get into it this is episode three of series three decorating written by carolyn ahern and craig cash and directed by carolyn ahern originally transmitted on the 30th of october 2000 all right, and let's get into decorating. And we can see in the opening shot that there is at least the threat of some decorating maybe happening. We can see the half-heartedly stripped wallpaper in the back, typical cans on the table. Hell, even the radio is going on in the background, which is a first for the show. And always, to me at least, connotes hard interior graft getting done. But of course, we don't see our unlikely heroes, Twig and Jim, right up against the coal face getting to it. Nah, I mean, they're seated, of course. Supping brews, languishing resting despite no doubt not deserving it. Twig with a sig in his hand and in his traditional sportswear and Jim out of his usual yellow and down to his vest. Obviously both of them then have put a lot of thought into being dressed for the occasion and what the task demands. And here's what the script says. A Saturday afternoon, the TV is off and the radio is turned to a music station. Jim and Twiggy are in the middle of stripping wallpaper by the hi-fi drinks cabinet. Jim is in his vest. They are both sat down having a breather. Now we have seen wallpaper scraped off the wall before in the show. Really, whenever we move from the lounge to the kitchen, there are traces of this noticeable. You know, prior attempts that have also no doubt gone to pot. And wallpaper, I mean, what is wallpaper? Well, wallpaper is a material used in interior decoration to decorate the interior walls of domestic and public buildings. It is usually sold in rolls and is applied onto a wall using wallpaper paste. England and France were leaders in European wallpaper manufacturing. Among the earliest known examples is one found on a wall from England and is printed on the back of a London proclamation of 1509. 
Wallpaper became very popular in England following Henry VIII's excommunication from the Catholic Church, where English aristocrats, who had always imported tapestries from Flanders and Arras, were now forced along with the gentry to turn to wallpaper. Playing in the background is Travis with Why Does It Always Rain On Me, a song that I can recall being absolutely everywhere at the time. And it's great that the show, in its own way, is right on the edge of a zeitgeist. I mean, we had the brand new Millionaire featuring Front and Centre last series. And here we have Why Does It Always Rain On Me, a big contemporary song of the day that's playing out in the background. And I mean, indeed, an even bigger song that undeniably has a bit more of a legacy than Travis, (laughs) sorry Fran Healy, will feature later in the episode. And who are Travis? Well, Travis are a Scottish rock band formed in Glasgow in 1990. The band's name comes from the character Travis Henderson from the film Paris, Texas, which is an amazing Wim Wenders film there. They broke through with their second album, The Man Who, in 1999, which spent nine weeks at number one on the UK album chart, totaling 134 weeks in the top 100. Why Does It Always Rain On Me is a song by the band, releases the third single from that album. The song became the group's international breakthrough single, receiving recognition around the world. It was their first top 10 hit single on the UK singles chart, peaking at number 10 in August 1999. When Travis began to perform the song at the 1999 Glastonbury Festival, after being sunny for several hours, it began to rain exactly when the first line was sung, and stopped at the end of the song. Their performance was a talking point of the festival, and their career took off afterwards. Twiggy asked Jim if Dave couldn't help out, Jim states that Denise has him under his thumb, and Jim also here doesn't seem to like the fact that his son-in-law is caring so much for his grandson. Seen him carrying the baby round all the bloody time. They never ever picked me kids up, unless they fell over. (laughs) (laughs) Me neither. (laughs) Jim, as we've always heard, was a bit more of a hands-off parent. You do feel that Dave's behaviour would be alien to Jim then. Especially perhaps as we've heard that Jim's own dad was a bit of a wrong and who was nasty to his mother. And Twiggy with the me neither there. I mean, you know, we know about the travails of little Lee and you imagine there's more sprogs for Twig in the mix as well. And Jim, perhaps unknown to himself, ironically, when he said that, sounds just like his daughter here in his entirely hands-free approach. And I feel like this episode also, in general, is the writer saying, yes, Dave is stupid now, flat out. He's making decisions and doing things that a sane person wouldn't do. I mean, it's going to be wrong for laughs, of course, but but the old cheeky chap who spoke of spending a night in his escort before in the pilot, I mean, he's gone. And in his place is the person who can't remember where he left his wheels, mere minutes after parking them. But, you know, we'll get to that. So before we meet Dave, you know, we have to hear about his latest foibles. Apparently, he called emergency services twice last week for baby David, which, okay, fair enough. You know, I've not had a kid, but I can only imagine the worry, and, you know, that's probably warranted. Now he's a bloody hell when we that baby. Twice last week he had the emergency doctor out to baby David. Ooh, Denise was bloody fuming. He woke her up both times, didn't he? Denise was bloody fuming, we hear. Because he woke her up both times. I mean, the jokes have such a defined pacing at this point, you know. It's difficult not to see them coming, but they're still so funny. You can really imagine it, can't you? Denise, roused from her sleep coma, flashing lights outside, an ambulance at the door, Dave worried with the baby. But I bet she wouldn't even be worried. You know, she'd just be fuming, as we've heard, that her sleep was interrupted. So beside Jim, as he's saying on this, is Twiggy just listening. And he's ever a worker, you know, he seems to be messing with a clock or something. Jim then goes on speaking about Dave being under the farm, getting into how she says shit and he jumps on the shovel. It's not even fun, Jim says, to even go out for a pint with the fella now, as he's always getting the pictures out, always talking about the farmyard. Now, you know, it may seem annoying, and we haven't really witnessed Dave in full parental patheticness, but maybe David is lucky that he's got Dave, to be honest. Twiggy laughs ruefully when Jim brings up the farmyard. Twig says that he's sick of it as well. I mean, that does show a bit of a lack of self-awareness there for Dave, as, yeah, share some pics, why not, you know, family snaps, but chewing someone's ear off about a farmyard that you've not even made, not even a relative either, though, you know, Twig is bloody family technically, but, yeah, tad wild. He's not a bloody man, Jim says. He's under the bloody thumb. You know, Jim's hammering it home now, laying it on thick. Which, of course, makes the irony, just after this, of these skivers pretending to work as Barbara comes in, even riper. Because as Jim is rhapsodising, we can hear someone shuffling in the background. It's Barbara. Barbara's home. And then, of course, the boys have to scurry off to pretend like they haven't been taking a tea break, despite the surface of the wallpaper barely being touched. He's under the bloody thumb, all right? He's not a bloody man. Quick. Oh, 
tell you what, this is hard work, this pub. It's not just like they down their stuff and rush to the wall, though. Jim actually, and this always sticks with me as it's grotesque and hilarious, Jim actually spits a whole mouthful of his brew back into the cup. You know, lest he just gulp it down and Barb smells it on his breath, I guess. The whole manoeuvre is incredible. Not least because these are two hefty geezers who I'm sure rarely move this quick, although we have got some dancing coming up in a moment. But yeah, Jim spits out a thick typhoon of typhoo, and then they get to work on the wall, scraping so little with such little effort that they may as well be trying to drink an ocean for a straw. So the door rattles and Barb comes through the front, the light streaming in from the window. She's got her bags full with shopping. Shopping in those anonymous coloured bags you'd get back in the day. You know, this was before the bag for life or 20p era or whatnot. So Barb comes into the dining room. Jim claims it's hard work and Barb greets Twiggy. She says she thought Jim was getting one of those steamer thingies so it could be done quick. But he, of course, makes it all about money. And there's a really nice shot here too as Barbara comes in and drops the shopping off, then moves into the kitchen. And the camera moves backwards in front of her, leaving her still visible in the kitchen as she chats to Jim, who is in the background, while still dropping off the stuff. And it's at this point that we can see Jim is using a damn spatula. I mean, sure, forgo the steam machine, ignore the mist if you must, but you need something that can actually pull paper off the wall in some way when you do this, or you're buggered. Jim, though, has a solution to all this, one that combines his fave drink and his fave pastime, saving money. Getting one of them steamer thingies so you can get it done quick. Well, for fifteen pounds a day, you put the kettle on, Barb. That'll make enough steam. <laughs> Twiggy, like Denise, likes his bacon dead crispy. And Barb then moves more of the shopping into the kitchen. And we can spot that one of the bags is from Nissa. Nissa being a brand and groceries wholesaler that you see a lot in the UK. I think it's wholly subsidised actually by the co-op group. So Jim had promised Barb that he'd have it all done by Baby David's christening, the wallpapering, but, you know, he promised he'd cook them a meal as well, didn't he? But that, uh, that pesky darts final that the feathers got in the way. Jim hasn't made much of an effort, unsurprisingly. Didn't cover the chairs or move the tables or any of that necessary prep work. Barb then comes into the dining room and takes her jacket off. And I must say, I love Barb's look in this episode. You know, we rarely see her in bright clothing. She's normally in more muted cardigans and kind of like, you know, baggy stuff. But here, she really glows in this look. You know what I'm talking about. She's got that like yellow t-shirt with the floral pattern on the front. You know, it suits her radiant personality. And Barb then indulges in one of her favourite pastimes, asking about little Lee. All right, Twiggy, how's your little Lee? What happened with Dixon's? Well, I went round here and wised them up. And luckily, they're not charging him now. Aww. Barbara aring to that statement. Aring to a father having to rough up an established business to stop them pressing charges against his offspring. Like father, like son, obviously. I mean, Jim will say this soon, and Twiggy will just laugh rambunctiously. Heart of gold, as Nana has said, etc. But what did Twiggy do, you wonder? I mean, did he get physical? Barb just thinks it's nice that he got out, I suppose, that there's no further trouble. But naturally, this won't be the first or last time, I'm sure. And we can also, when this is being said, also see Jim at this point literally stroking the wall with his spatula, doing literally less than nothing in the battle against the wallpaper. And Dixon's, Dixon's Retail PCL, was one of the largest consumer electronic retailers in Europe. In the UK, the company operated Curry's, Curry's Digital, PC World, Dixon's Travel, and its service brand, Know How. The company merged with Carphone Warehouse in 2014 to create Dixon's Carphone. At the time of the merger, Dixon's Street had 530 outlets in the UK and 322 in Northern Europe. And, you know, I've got a lot of fond memories. I'm sure all 90s kids remember Dixon's and PC World and Corrie's and all those sort of places. They're just not the same now, you know. But back in the day, it was just it was just wonderful to see all the games in those weird, big, thick glass cases that you had to pick them up on and the, and the desktops and fancy fridges and whatnot. Jim rightly points out that the wallpaper's happening for the christening, which is only happening because Denise can't be arsed. But come on, Jim. I mean, if the christening happened at Denise's, None of us would have gotten to see what happened. Well, for 30 minutes at least. Twig then says to Jim that he saw Cheryl the other night. And you think, oh, okay, you know, there have been hints of those two, will they, won't they, sort of thing. But where he saw her was outside the chippy, waiting for it to open. Jim is in hysterics, and it's unclear if this is a dig or just true. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, of course, but knowing Cheryl, knowing her impatience for chips, that we'll see in the next episode, Elsie's funeral, oh, I can't wait to get to that one. I mean, it's kind of believable, isn't it, to think Cheryl will just be waiting for the shutters to go up, waiting for the ovens and fryers to turn on, getting proper fresh, you know? So Barb comes in, 
does the classic huffing and holding your head up with your hands when you look at some interior decorating. You know the sort of pose I'm talking about. It looks dead common, this wallpaper, she says. Which, of course, you know, we've explored this many times on the show. The writers like to lean into the fact that the royals don't think they're common. You know, um, we hear about another family at the christening, don't we, at the end of this series. But, of course, they are, you know, in certain eyes. They would be considered by most. And that's an irony that they enjoy kind of indulging in. I mean, think of Ant with the sovereign ring, etc. When, when everyone declared it was top, but, you know, it was really a bit naff, I suppose. She'll be glad to get the wood chip up, she says, instead of the wallpaper, and Twiggy concurs, saying it's a pound a roll. So this is something he's helped out with, I guess. You know, he'll do the wallpaper and get to say with a wood chip. I mean, he has to sweeten the deal some way, doesn't he? And is wood chip better than wallpaper? I mean, I was Googling around when I was doing this episode looking for, like, wood chip interior decoration, and there's literally no pictures of this. Like, when you look at wood chip, it is not used to put on the wall. Like, maybe that's the joke. And I can kind of imagine what it looked like, that kind of grainy. Like, I think back in my nan's house, like, she would have had some ink in that kind of world. And the wallpaper doesn't look that bad, really. And, of course, in the end, after this episode and beyond, there's no wood chip and the wallpaper stays. Barb's excited, though. Smiles at the wall, she's geed up by the potential of the situation, and returns to the kitchen with a grin. After this, a song clicks over on the radio, which is an old red radio, by the way, it's on the cabinet, separating Jim and Twig from the rest of the room. The song clicks over, and we can hear the opening beats of Mambo Number no. 5. Now let's get into the song first. Mambo No. 5 is an instrumental mambo and jazz dance song originally composed and recorded by Cuban musician Demeso Perez Prado in 1949 and released the next year. German singer Lou Bega sampled the original for a new song released under the same name on Bega's 1999 debut album A Little Bit of Mambo. Bega's version became a summer hit during 1999 in most of Europe, and later that year it experienced success in the UK, North America and Oceania. In France, it set a record by staying at number 1 for 20 weeks. And yeah, this song was just like, you know when just stuff sticks in your mind for whatever reason? Like, I remember being a kid, a young boy, going to a car boot. Maybe I was like seven or something, so that would have been like 99 when this kicked off. It must have been around then. And I remember this song like blasting out of a car, and everyone like singing along and enjoying it. Like, just like random strangers and stuff. Like, it just, just had this weird effect on people. It, it is a great song. I mean, you know, it's classic. On the 3rd of September 2001, this is interesting, BBC Records released a novelty version of the song sung by British actor Neil Morrissey, who provided the voice of Bob. The cover radically changed the lyrics to fit the theme of the show, making numerous references to construction, repairs and roadway maintenance, as well as the show's characters. On the 9th of September 2001, the song debuted at number one on the UK charts, becoming Bob the Builder's second number one single after Can We Fix It? However, following the September 11th attacks, the song was removed from the BBC Radio 2 playlist, with the station's executive music producer describing the song as being too frivolous in light of the news that was breaking. Now, back to the show. I would argue that this is probably the most famous moment in the show's history, this dance sequence. I mean, it's one that has crossed into the public consciousness past any other from Messrs, Ahern, Cash and the rest. You know, of course people know... Jim and my arse and mouthing off from the chair and you know maybe Jim and Denise on the bathroom floor perhaps but like I could just remember not only like compilations of great TV moments they always show this dance moment but I think anyone kind of recognizes this I think you know it seems to go semi-viral pretty regular on groups and stuff like that and it does stand out really more than any other moment in the show I mean we will have dancing again in the christening but This kind of energy, this kind of level, this kind of creativity and, you know, just unexpectedness kind of marks it out for me. And how was this written and planned, I wonder? You know, how was this concocted in terms of choreography? So we're stationed behind Jim and Twig as they work, you know, I suppose you can call it that. And this is just a beautifully realised shot from the off here of the decorating as there's a sea of blue stripes around them and they've cleaved but a single percentage off of it. And even then they haven't done a very good job. But yeah, we're behind them, both in their jeans that Twiggy no doubt stole from somewhere, and I'm sure Jim still hasn't paid for. And Twiggy is the first, as Mambo number no. 5 plays, Twiggy's the first to start off the dance, starting to dip and bop a little to the impossible-to-resist rhythm. Then they both start to swing, Jim tapping his spatula on the wall in time. I mean, Jim, after all, is a musician in his own right, lest we forget. He's got rhythm. And from here, it just subtly builds and builds as the song pumps out from the radio. I mean, it's so clever here. How many times have we had these long shots in the show where people just do nothing, where we scan across faces watching TV or Ant and Darren smashing sausage and mash, but here for the first time we have a long shot in the show filled with action, filled with life and movement. And the script, the script has very little direction interestingly. Here's what it says, Mambo number 5 by Lou Bega, a little bit of Monica etc, comes on the radio. 
Jim and Twiggy scrape wallpaper in time to the music and Barbara starts dancing to the music as she unpacks her shopping in the kitchen. So Jim wiggles his ass as it goes further, but both of the guys don't seem to be registering each other at this point, at least outwardly. You know, rather they're in their own decorating, boogieing worlds. Now when the chorus kicks in, they go a bit further, seeming to synchronise here. The camera then cuts back to Barb in the kitchen, rocking out in her own world, shaking her own bottom, raising the shopping bag up high as if bringing baby David to her. You know, everyone, it seems, is just enveloped in this moment. We're out of the kitchen again now, and Jim is crouched towards Twig, pumping his hands as Twig acknowledges him and moves alongside. We then head back into the kitchen briefly as Barb unsheaves a loaf of bread from a bag. And then once more, we're into the living room. There's so many stylish cuts here. It's almost like a secondary music video for Lou Bega. We're back in the living room, where it's clear the boys will do anything but work. You know, prized off from the wall, they are now moving in their own little pods now, thrashing around like rock stars to the Latin rhythms. Barb is cut to briefly again, and we can see three cups on the table before it's back to the guys, who are twirling around now with their spatulas and having a right riot. They even start jumping around. Jim is the first to do a little hop, and Twiggy chuckles before doing the same. And then the same shot that was used earlier, which I spoke about, which allows us to see the kitchen and the decorating simultaneously, this is employed again, as Barb loads the fridge, and the guys keep working, but are ultimately fully grooved out now. Barb, it seems too, is in her own world, and she hasn't even noticed, I don't think, that her hubby and her mate are putting on like a show-stopping Cirque du Soleil performance just adjacent. Barb too is swooning her shoulders as well, even when she's just depositing some veg in the cupboard. Back to Jim and Twig again, with Twig now twirling under Jim's fingernails like a puppet, his hand on his scalp. The two then finally join together, you know, they've been building up to this point, and start to dance ballroom style. Swanning out like it's blumming Torval and Dean, you know, who Jim had called Dave and Denise during Nana's coming to stay. Barb plops the bacon on, onto the pan, and then we get to the horn breakdown of the track, which is a great moment. Jim spins around on one blast and encourages Twig to do another. It really is a joy to see, and oddly, something that doesn't feel out of place in the show. I will say, however, this is probably the most special moment, as in the special. So when I say special, I'm talking about kind of after Queen of Sheba. I know it's a special as well, but kind of the four after that are very different from everything that precedes it, aren't they? This is probably the most special, quote unquote, moment that the show gets. I mean, after all, the thought of Jim and Twig just dancing around for three minutes to a bombastic number. It's kind of unimaginable generally within this universe from what we've seen up until this point. But it just works. It still has the same care, thought and direction that the show always does, you know. It feels real. It makes sense in a certain way that these two mates would just bunk off work and and have a laugh regardless of how apparently ridiculous it seems. As the notes peel out, Barb peels a streak of bacon from the package and dips it down, herself still funking out to the rhythm as the trumpets blare. Jim and Twig, Jeffrey and Ricky, you know, were of course great mates in real life so the chemistry works. And in Sue Johnston's excellent autobiography, which I highly recommend, Things I Couldn't Tell My Mother, she actually talks about them, Not I don't, I don't think it was the beginning of this episode, it might have been, but I don't think it was, but she talks about them at lunch, they would go out and like just buy power tools for a laugh that they didn't need and all that sort of stuff, you know. So they, they just had that camaraderie in there. The song then ends, the song then comes to a close, and I mean, it's such an enrapturing like two or three minutes when this is going on. The song ends, and we hear Big Jeff, the DJ. Jim sings a bit of mambo to himself and bows over laughing, both of them out of breath from the exercise and just the sheer happy spluttering itself, you know, Twig is even holding onto the wall somewhat. Hello, this is Pete and Jeff on the best music mix on 4.9 FM. Yeah. Vega, the choice of Leon competing with the classic man. <sighs> Jim asks if Twig wouldn't mind a bit of Cheryl, with Twiggy correcting him that that is impossible, you know, getting a bit of her. I mean, ouch! Two Cheryl digs in the space of five minutes. I mean, nothing new here in the Royal Homestead, I guess. Twiggy then reveals, moving on, something that Jim didn't know about. He said it was funny, what with Dave getting the police around with a van. Something Jim's really interested in. The way Ricky says, you are, you know, is so real. Such a common British way of conveying, like, what did you just say? Twig doesn't want to say anything at first. Jim refers to him as R. Dave, which is sweet. And besides Twig, too, we can see this odd bronze African antelope gazelle type bust on the wall that we've never seen before. Another weird addition <laughs> to Chez Royale. So Jim badges him and Twig reveals all. Twig, who we can see is rocking a more typical tool for excavation. Right, well, last week... Dave nipped down to the chemist round the corner in the van and then walked back home. Forgot he bloody drove there. <laughs> so the next morning, he gets up, looks out, sees the van's missing, phones the police saying it's been robbed. Ten minutes later, the police find the van outside the chemist where he left it. The, 
He nearly did him for wasting police time. <laughs> Jim, throughout this telling, is washing himself, grabbing a rag and rubbing it under his pits, smelling it and then administering it to his face. And what can we say about this story altogether? I mean, wow, this is like dementia levels of stupidity. I mean, you forgot you drove there. You called the police only for them to find it instantly. Ugh. It's something to take more seriously, but it is a comedy, you know, and it is a funny story, so we have to kind of approach it that way. Barb is cut to prepping the teas and she brings them in. She asks what they're laughing at. Jim regales Barbara with the details, calls Dave a top hat, which is a great insult. I think it's like a condom euphemism, but, you know, it's one of those words that, like, just sounds great as an insult. Like, I remember uh, on my old Battle Rap podcast, I was interviewing this guy from Brighton, bit of a geezer. And what did he call someone? He called, oh, yeah, he's a bit of a yogurt. He's a yogurt, that guy. Barbara's ever, though, sees the best in people. Says it's easy done, and she bets the police have a few of them every day. I mean, really, Barbara, a few. Like, I've no doubt that Dave's escapade would have been bandied about the station instantly as a story of instant idiotic legend. Her mind is elsewhere, though, Barb. It's more on baby David and how far he's coming along. It's why they're doing it at the room, she says, for the christening. Which gives way to a shot of Jim and Twig standing beside each other, kind of despondently responding to that, you know, just kind of unengaged, I suppose. Twig is an ass if he's coming and if he's bringing his girlfriend, Michelle. Jim from behind is begging no. <laughs> Twig asks if Barb is short, and Barb comes back with the classic, more the merrier. And in the script, it says here as form of direction, Jim is standing behind Twiggy, making faces at Barbara for Twiggy's girlfriend not to be invited. Now, this is very classic comedy here, isn't it? With Jim uttering behind Twig's back that he doesn't want her. And then, of course, when Twig turns around, he's smiling, encouraging. Twig himself seems surprised. Not at the hospitality. I mean, after all, he's been around for several Sunday dinners, invited or not, as we've established. Don't mind me, Barb, etc. But he seems to be a little caught off guard here. And, you know, man, I can't wait until we get to Michelle. Sally Lindsay, like, you know, there's quite a few in the show, isn't there, like, one-shot characters. But I think undeniably Sally Lindsay is the queen of that. Like, she just knocks it out of the park there. You know, Roger's there as well, don't get me wrong. But, like, I just, I just love Michelle. And she isn't that bad, Michelle, in the 30 minutes that we see her. I mean, sure, she's rude to Cheryl, Denise... And Norma, actually, when she's out the room. You know, but she's charming and fun in a certain way. Maybe not charming. You get what I'm saying, though. She's a little endearing, a little rough around the edges. Though you imagine as the night goes on, she'd be a little worse, a little more intolerable, perhaps. uh, You know, as the christening went on to the wee hours. So Barbara sort of eyes Twiggy for a moment after this is said. Thinking, perhaps, maybe wondering that uh, perhaps Michelle might not be the best choice. But, oh, well, it's Barb. She's too warm. She's not got long to ponder, however, as the bell rings. And Barb, of course, sets off to get it. The lounge as she passes through festooned with baby stuff. It's Dave at the door, of course. Jim and Twig leaning, listening, and Twiggy, still with laughter in his voice, tells Jim not to say a word about the van, and he means it. Jim tells him not to worry, and Barb introduces Dave really happily, probably more so that he's got the grandson with him, but, you know, of course, Jim just can't help himself. He he can't hold it in. All right, Dave. Where's the van? (laughs) What? I said, how's your mum? Oh, she's fine, thanks, yeah. <laughs> Dave, who has the baby, as I mentioned, the nappy bag, another bag too. He's really decked out in the stuff. And Jim then rescues his sudden faux pas by saying he was saying, how's your mum? But obviously this isn't going to last long here. Barbara takes the chair off Dave and smiles at the baby and then carts it back to the guys and they all perch around saying, hello. You know, it's lovely. Dave laughs too. Dave laughs in this moment and then he's asked where Denise is. She's next door looking at Cheryl's new scales. And even here, he seems unsure of himself, pausing before scales for no discernible reason. I mean, has he already forgot? The conversation then rumbles on until Dave is rumbled. And what I adore most here is Twiggy's laugh. Jeffrey Hughes is just unreachable at this point, lost in his own giggles. It's wonderfully acted. You know, the pair of them, they snort, they stagger, they make those weird sounds you make when you just can't control yourself laughing. You know, Dave says, I bet you told them, and Twiggy protests, though the fact that he's barreled up in hysterics doesn't help his defence. I told you not to, Dave says half-heartedly, and wow, I mean, Jim and Twiggy, Ricky and Jeffrey, their their acting here is sublime. I mean, they really do seem to be crying in laughter. Nothing feels forced or faux. You know, I don't think I've laughed like that in years. Jim then says they won't tell a soul before bringing up the feathers, and Dave seems genuinely upset here, so Jim blackmails him slightly, asking for some help with the scraping, you know, to keep his silence. Though I bet, of course, this got mentioned down the feathers. I mean, how could you not talk about this, right? Who could resist sharing such a story? So Barb brings in the bacon butties, and Dave asks for one. 
Barb says, of course, and then says she's sorry for the police having a go at Dave, which causes the gents to erupt again. And I mean, yeah, you know, he was wasting valuable police time due to his own rare brand of stupidity. Dave seems embarrassed further at this as well, face tight. Doesn't acknowledge what Barb has said, but just asks for some red sauce, please. Red sauce being Dave's fave, as we've covered many times in the show. And here he's rocking a red sweater of sorts, his crucifix again front and centre. I don't think the inference is that he's embraced religion as he's gotten dimmer, but it's something to ponder. You should have got a steamer, Dave says, and Jim, sandwich in hand, disagrees and urges his son-in-law to work. It's funny because they didn't even take down the piece of art on the wall they're scraping right next to. I mean, normally you'd aim to clear a whole wall in one go, but obviously very little is going to get done here. And Dave, like Twiggy, is a grafter at heart and gets on with it. And here we have another patented raw family shot of three people close together, this time looking at the wall in front of them as opposed to the box. They really are useless though. No warm water of a mop to apply to allow it to come off easier. You know, we've seen them actually toiling at this job for like 10 minutes pretty much now, sans a little dance off. And it looks exactly the same. The radio continues and in the kitchen, Barb is tending to baby David before stating that she's got to cook some bacon for his father. And, you know, it's worth thinking about here, it's worth mentioning that we've heard a lot of the radio in this episode, but we've seen none of the TV. And indeed, this is the first episode in the show where the TV is never turned on. We even see it late night, you know, we see it on the morning of the wedding, etc. And this will be something they employ again soon in season three's exquisite closer, The Christening. So then after this, Denise and Cheryl enter the kitchen. Cheryl, who is making her debut this series, but will feature in some of its best episodes, Elsie's funeral, and of course, the much-hyped Christening. Denise comes in warmly. A new streak in her hair, which looks more like something a 90s youth would get than a mother, but it works. And her new outfit seems to match in its floral leanings too. Cheryl, she's slightly dumpier in her outerwear, a thick cardigan above a jumper. The two friends then go over to baby David on the table and fuss over him a little. Cheryl fusses more, stating that he was so good for her all yesterday. And we hear the baby laugh warmly and and then Denise tells Barbara what they've been getting up to. Oh, you're so good. You're so gorgeous. He was so good for me all day yesterday. Oh, was he? Yeah. Oh. Hey, ma'am, Cheryl's just been showing me her new scales. Oh, have you got some new scales, Cheryl? Yeah. Oh, what are they like? Much more accurate. You mean you're lighter on them? Yeah. Oh. You mean you're lighter on them? I mean, how real? Poor Cheryl trying to find excuses for a wait through anything but herself. I mean, remember in the pilot when there was talk of catalogue jackets not fitting her as the sizes were to cock? They were American sizes. Much more accurate as well is wild, and it's nice to see how Barb seems to know exactly what she means when she says this. It's kind of, they're kind of all in on it, aren't they? Saying the opposite to what Jim would no doubt utter if she said to the family that her scales were more accurate. Denise then wants what she wants, a ciggy. So she tells Cheryl, I mean, she asks nicely, but it is an order to take the child upstairs, allowing her and her mum to have a ciggy. He isn't, of course, old enough baby David yet to make this decision, so unfortunately Denise will have to make provisions. Everyone says goodbye, baby David, and as soon as he's off screen, Denise says, yeah, and passes her mama sig whilst lighting up. And then, as if on cue, Barbara sees an example of Denise being a neglectful, unengaged mother, but praises her for it, calling her a good mother. She then asks if Denise is doing her pelvic floor exercises, but of course the baby is taking all the time. And pelvic floor exercises there, you know, postnatal exercises that strengthen the muscles around the bladder, vagina, and bottom. They can stop to help incontinence, improve prolapse, and make sex better too, according to the NHS. We then hear something outrageous on the behalf of old Shezza. Hey, isn't it good of Cheryl using up her holidays to look after baby David? Well, she's his godmother, you know. He is her responsibility. Her own holiday. We all know how precious that is, and it's especially egregious considering that every day for Denise is a holiday. I wonder where Cheryl works as well. I don't think we hear about that, but I could be wrong. And altogether, this isn't just a sign of Denise's monstrously nonchalant approach to child rearing, but also her control, I suppose, over Cheryl. You know, I'm sure very few people in real life would give up their holiday to rear their friend's tot, especially when they aren't at work themselves. They're just napping. But, you know, perhaps poor Cheryl, she's got nowhere to go, nothing to do. Happy to do it. It's kind of sad, really. She is her responsibility too, Denise says as well. I mean, it's a brilliant yet galling moment. I mean, yeah, you know, godmother, godfather can come with some expectations, but taking annual leave for the little one when it isn't an emergency, that's not one of them. Barb then seems to come down on Denise somewhat, but naturally her daughter has all the answers. You know, Denise, you are going to have to spend a full day on your own with him soon. I know, but post-baby fatigue, what can you do? 
She hasn't spent a whole day with this child yet. I mean, he's not even straight out the womb anymore either. I mean, perhaps he's a couple months old. Poor baby David. You know, babies need attachment to their mother more than anything else, and Denise is just blaming it on post-baby fatigue. I mean, she seems to have had that fatigue since she's been a baby. Barb doesn't even say anything to that. Just moves her hand a little helplessly before turning around with a sig to tend to a bit of Dave's bloody bacon. We're into the lounge now, and the three men are coordinatingly scratching away. Some more seems to have come off at the top at least, with twig section embedded deepest. And this is another long, uninterrupted shot, with Jim again appearing to be the worst at this, swooping at the wall with the spatula rather than actually getting under the layers. He lambasts Dave for not using some elbow grease. Dave who, rather than ploughing his elbow further, just peels off a dainty strip of his finger. Something that gets an enthusiastic response from Jim. Dave asks if they're doing the ceiling as well. I mean, there's wallpaper on the ceiling? I mean, it could be something more general, of course, but Jim says to keep shtum about that. They continue working. Dave peels further. Jim smells his pit and grimaces, applying the towel again to it. Then we cut to Cheryl coming back downstairs and walking into the kitchen. Now, I have read on the show many times outside of the show that Jessica Stevenson, she wore a fat suit for Cheryl. And here it is none the clearer as she traverses in. You know, it looks fake in the best possible way, these rolling rolls. He's gone down, she says. And Denise says, who? Well, who else? I mean, you know, this is similar in a way to Dave forgetting about his farmyard for an instant after telling the family about it in the first episode of this series. I mean, a caring mother would ask as soon as Cheryl comes in, how is he? Has he settled? But Denise, I mean, she just isn't like that. So Cheryl sits down, the bacon popping in the pan, obviously the smell fanning out. Cheryl asks if it's bacon. No, clearly it is. And Barbara offers her one without even thinking as she's so caring. Cheryl says thanks, really smiling in this moment twirling her hair like a schoolgirl, excited at this prospect. Denise is asked, and she says yeah, then no, and repeats this a few times. Oddly indecisive. Tellingly unable to make up her mind over a bacon butty, I mean, let alone a baby priorities. Cheryl, ever the friend though, sees an opportunity here, saying if it's made and Denise doesn't want it, she'll have it. I mean, Jesus, you know, Cheryl. And Cheryl, after this, she looks down for a second, sadly. It's just a moment, you know, but maybe she feels awkward, out of place in herself. It's not clear, but it's a nice affectation. I mean, she takes care of the baby, so I guess she can take care of Denise's sandwich as well. And look, we all love old Shezza, or and all, of course, but she is not the uh, crispiest piece of bacon in the pan, is she? Do you know they're stripping the wall in there, Barbara? Oh, no, it's for baby David's christening. No, Barb didn't realise. I mean, really, Cheryl? And it's not like someone out there doing work in the garden that might be stealing or something, potentially, someone that you don't recognise. It's three members of the family. I mean, Twig essentially is, you know, doing laborious, time-consuming work. Why wouldn't Barbara know, you know? Cheryl, of course, has been established before as a bit slow on the uptake. Like that time when she asked if Anthony had had his hair dyed. The fact, too, that it's three weeks away to the christening, and that's episode six, whilst this is episode three, plays to the fact that each episode is a snapshot of a single week in these people's lives. Something they did in series one, with the wedding being six weeks away in the pilot, etc. So there's talk about that coming up, and it's hilarious that even the thought of the christening is making Denise tired. And also the fact that she says she has another six pounds to lose before she's a size ten. Something Cheryl sadly agrees with and then looks down at her own unenviable paunch. The door then clicks behind them and it's Darren and Anthony. They don't say hello, they just walk in, asking for out to eat. Barbara rightly calls them out for not saying hello to anyone and says, I don't know Anthony, as she tends to the bacon clearly in the pan. There's then some awkward hellos between Aunt Darren, Cheryl and Denise. Barb getting in, saying hello Darren. And thinking that perhaps the lack of pleasantries was causing the lack of bacon. Aunt asks if there's anything to eat which gets a solid no. I mean, maybe not the bacon then, but she did just come in with bagfuls of shopping prior. There's nothing in there. Not even a club biscuit. And then Dave pops in. Hiya, Dave. Oh, hiya, Dan. Hiya, Dave. Hiya, Darren. Hiya, Dave. Oh, hiya, Cheryl. Barbara. Hiya, Dave. No, can I have my bacon butter, please? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Love the chorus of ayahs there. Barbara joining in, even though they've already said hello. You know, it's a force of habit, I guess. So Barbara slaps the butty down with an open part. It's like a bit off, you know, just to squeeze it, but whatever. Then passing it across in front of the hungry Anthony and Darren to Dave. So Dave heads back with his butty into the dining room to chat to Jim and Twiggy, both of whom now have cans of ale in their hands. I mean, a cuppa, a butty, alcohol. Beats working, I guess. And now maybe feeling a little slighted over his own gossip being spread around, Dave clues the guys up on the latest Darren news. Hey, you know Darren in there... You know who he's seen, don't you? Who? Oh, big Julie from Argos. The one who looks like Tina Turner. Eh? <laughs> big Julie from Argos? Yeah. How old is she? 
late 30s or something, about 36, 37, 38, 39, something like that. <laughs> So much to unpack there. I mean, we've had Argos, the catalogue store, mentioned on the show before. Barbara actually mentioned it when she asked Jim where they got their camera from, and it was from Argos and Jim's birthday. But what is Darren doing here? I mean, love is love, but it's clearly quite the mismatch from what we're hearing and what we know of Darren, both physically and mentally. Is it some sort of inside job on his part to canvas for more fridge freezers and appliances to Nick? Big Julie from Argos is such a title too. I mean, we all know these people, don't we? You have an adjective in a workplace. X Johnny from Y, etc. And Tina Turner. I mean, it's so funny that Tina Turner is a big part of this episode because I just recently have become a giant Tina Turner fan. Like, I've always appreciated her music, of course, but it was basically sparked by watching What's Love Got To Do With It, which I think is from, like, 91. Amazing biopic of her life and, and her ill-fated relationship with the wrong and Ike Turner. Uh, it's Angela Bassett, Lawrence Fishburne. If you've not seen that film, that really kind of was one of the best biopics I've ever seen. So I watched that. That, started listening to her music, watched a documentary about her life, and then when it was my birthday a few months ago, my girlfriend, God love her, got us tickets to see the Tina Turner musical, which was excellent, so, you know, I'm all in with Tina. And who is Tina? Well, Tina Turner, born Anna Mae Bullock, is an American-born Swiss singer and actress. Widely referred to as the Queen of Rock and Roll, she rose to prominence as a lead singer of the Ike and Tina Turner Review, before launching a successful career as a solo performer. Having sold over 100 million records worldwide, Turner is one of the best-selling recording artists of all time. She has received 12 Grammy Awards, which include 8 competitive awards, 3 Grammy Hall of Fame Awards, and a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. And she was the first black artist and first female to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. So Big Julie from Argos is spoke of, and Twig here, I mean, saying he'd have a pop too. You know him, he'd sleep with any old shite, I suppose. Jim is clearly in disbelief, though, at the revelation of this pairing. His spuds have only just dropped, and Tina Turner's got a hold of them, he says. Everyone laughs. He pumps his fist in that triumphant gym way. And, as always, he turns to his son-in-law, Dave, asking if he's having any of that. I mean, Sophie wasn't interested, Emma's mate, so, so I guess Darren started looking elsewhere. We then cut back to Darren and co. in the kitchen. Cheryl has just finished the sandwich, clearly ravishing it in a few bites. I mean, that's considering that Dave got his and he's still eating it before her, so she would have really demolished this, you know. She's licking her lips, stating that was lovely. Thanks, Barbara. Barbara, who we cut to in a hilarious shot, with just her perched on the worktop, leaning angular and askew, as if she's scrutinising something she just can't comprehend. I mean, she looked at the wallpapering earlier in a similar mode, but that was with hope and potential. This look of hers is one of confusion. Disgust, maybe even. Her brow furrowed and her arm holding her head up. I don't know how you can eat mayonnaise and ketchup together, Cheryl. And mayo, this is the first time mayo is referenced on the royal family, would you believe? Mayonnaise, colloquially referred to as mayo, is a thick, cold and creamy sauce or dressing, commonly used on sandwiches, hamburgers, composed salads and french fries. Mayonnaise is a French cuisine appellation that seems to have appeared for the first time in 1806. The hypotheses invoked over time as to the origins of mayonnaise have been numerous and contradictory. Most hypotheses do, however, coincide in the geographical origin of the sauce, Mahan, in Mallorca, Spain. Other theories other than this have been dismissed by some authors as being somewhat a retrospective invention, aiming to credit the source of an invention of southwestern France, when, most likely, its origin can be found in the port city of Menorca. I mean, mayo and ketchup these days are kind of official condiments in those weird Heinz concoctions, and, you know, it's not a massively odd mix, but still, yeah, a bit indulgent. Cheryl doesn't really respond to what Barb says either about the sauces, just licks her plate clean with her finger, as if to say, I love them together. I mean, the whole scene is so perfect, with its shots back and forth cut for maximum effect. So we open with Cheryl eating, then cut to Barb baffled, then back to Cheryl licking her plate clean with her bare fingers, into a shot of Denise, Ant and Darren, all looking at her, quietened, disgusted perhaps by what they've just seen. And what have they seen? I mean, Cheryl going to town on Asani like only she could, I suppose. One thinks of that Jurassic Park feeding moment. Darren looks particularly aggrieved. Cheryl then pushes her plate away from her, the mixture of the two sauces clear on the small dish. No one is saying anything. She's just there, digesting. And I mean, Darren and Anthony did merge ketchup and mash with their dinners before and indulge, but that was more of a private thing amongst friends. Where's Cheryl's extra sandwich too? I mean, did she just have both? It doesn't look like Denise had hers, but it's kind of hard to tell with the clutter of the table. We're back in the living room with the lads, and we're at a slightly further away angle now. We can see a column that we haven't seen before, and there's an old chintzy plate hanging off it. Chatting away is Twig, letting the lads know about some other new characters we've never heard of. I mean, along with Big Julie from Argos, it's Black Roy and his white wife. Black Roy has put on weight, apparently, and Jim insults him, saying he's lazy, saying his white wife waits on him hand and foot. I mean, 
It all feels very familiar, doesn't it? And like Big Julie from Argos, Black Roy and his white wife is so typical of these kind of nicknames, isn't it? A quick distinguishing factor to establish a person and nothing more. I mean, it probably wasn't PC back then, but you certainly couldn't just call someone Black Roy nowadays. I mean, admittedly the addition of white wife kind of anchors it, I suppose. And Dave, ever dim, asks who Jim is talking about, despite being literally in the middle of the conversation between these two loud novelers on the wall. Oh, Dave. And Twig continues, saying that they've got Sky Digital, something mentioned in the opening of the third series, and again, a bit of foreshadowing towards the second Christmas special. Dave, ever, ever dim, asks if they've got Sky Digital, despite just hearing that they do. And Twig says that they've got all the channels. I love the choice here of the camera, of Caroline, the director, I suppose, and the crew to draw the camera closer to the wall, so at this point we can just see the arms of the fellas only. You know, it's been clear from the off that they aren't really doing any work, but here we can see it clear as day that Jim is merely caressing the wall with the spatula and not getting any closer to actually getting anything off. And Dave then asked Twiggy more about the Sky Digital package. Have we got the movie channels? Yeah, they got the lot. Have we got Sky Sports 1, 2 and 3 channels? Yeah, they got the lot. Have we got the Discovery Channel? Yes, they've got the bloody lot, Dave, the jammy get! Can't you bloody understand what he's saying? <laughs> Jim seems more annoyed about Black Roy's selection than Dave's brain-dead questioning here. And it's great that in that angle of their arms we see Jim's spatula fall as he gets angry, and then the camera pans out when he explodes. Jim's son-in-law continues with inquiries, asking Jim if he's going to get Sky Digital himself, but, but naturally he says he wouldn't have the time to make the most of it. We're back in the kitchen now. I mean, this is another episode that makes great use of two environments. And Barb is asking Cheryl about old Joe. Oh, Cheryl, I forgot to ask you. How's your dad's ingrowing toenail? Oh, he still can't get his shoe on, Barbara. Oh. He's resting his foot on a puff. <laughs> <laughs> Hard not to laugh there, I suppose. A puff obviously being a slur, but the funnier aspect of the joke to me here is not that, oh, hey, that's a word for a homosexual, but more the slightly abstract image of doleful Joe resting a painful foot on a gay man. I mean, this is quite a serious conversation, really, but the boys can't help it, and we've seen prior when Fern Britton asked Bob Holness for a pee on Ready Steady Cook, or just now with Jim and Twig and the Dave story. Sometimes it's just too hard to keep the laughter in. Poor Cheryl just looks sad, though. Bob doesn't really know what to say. It's worth noting, too, that Joe has broken his foot before, dropping a fridge freezer on it, so that probably didn't help proceedings in his healing. We're back into the living room again, and Jim is sitting on the ladder now, scraping higher and higher. Dave asks Twig if he's looking for a car for him, which he says he is, but he's having difficulty within the price room it. £200 isn't much for a car these days, he says, which, damn, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you wouldn't even get an old fizzy for that. There's a mention of Ken Pugh here as well in the script, and you kind of hear Twiggy say this. Now, by my googling, this isn't anyone famous or anything like that. It's a neuroscientist on Wikipedia, apparently. So, interesting. I don't know who that is. Maybe it's just kind of another character they slipped in there. He then says, Twig says, that he might have found a little runner for Dave, smooth and that. But the one little drawback is that it's a milk float. I mean, Jim says that that would suit him, and Dave agrees, saying he could pop the moped on the back, with Jim questioning then, why would he do that? As if he's going anywhere, he's going on the milk float. Why would he need the moped too? I mean, Dave and his habit of leaving vehicles, he just can't get over it, I suppose. In the kitchen again, and Barb is putting some bacon on, relenting her barrier to the butties for the boys. She asks about Darren's community service, which has seemingly been meted out for the sentencing we heard about in Anthony's birthday. And Daz says he did some this morning, and he has over a year to get done. Ugh. Barbara says, aw, that it'll soon go over smile, and perhaps it'll make him think of not doing it again. I mean, he's done it twice, and he's been caught twice. And Barbara asks if this taught him a lesson. Has it taught you a lesson? Yeah, don't get caught. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> Funny response, not the ideal one, but everyone laughs. Well, Aunt Denise and Barb do. It's hard to hear if Cheryl's laughing, and we don't see her. I imagine she wouldn't be really... She can kind of be part of the joke sometimes, but she's always just a little step behind, isn't she? Aunt says nice one to this and laughs along. And the men in the living room are seemingly getting a bit more stuck into it, with Dave in particular making headway. But this is all postponed for a moment, as Jim's fart smell causes a ruckus. Jim, that's bloody terrible, that is, Twig says, and you imagine Twig has smelt some shite in his time. Twig pops a cigarette in, and Jim tries to blame it on the paste, fanning his nevers with the spatula. Dave rightly says he needs raking out. And Twig, Twig is full of tales today from the feathers, as he then brings up an old flame of Dave's. High heels, fishnets, short white leather skates, low cut top, baps out the lot. She looked a beast. Oh What's her face like, Twig? I've never managed to look that high up. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I tell you what, Dave, you slipped up there, didn't you? Jump in here for our Denise. It's wild that Denise's own father is saying to Dave that he slipped up dumping bed for his own daughter. I mean, that's a real betrayal of the paternal contract. She must have some really gorgeous knockers, as Anthony said earlier, I suppose. Jim then talks about twiddling nipples. He says, you know what I mean, to twig. I mean, it's all getting rambunctious. The laughter's riling up. Jim calls him twiglet as well, which is a sweet term of affection. And Twiggy, you know, he ain't the most PC of gents. That is clear from all we know about him. But is he wrong here? I know you're not supposed to say this in this day and age, what with the millennium and all that, but you cannot beat a great pair of knockers. Oh, that's oh. too loud. I mean, the personality doesn't keep you warm at night, does it? No. I mean, you can't play with a personality. No. But you can play with a bloody big pair of baps, though. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> you can't play with a personality, but you can play with a bloody big pair of baps, though. I mean, that should be on Twiggy's gravestone. <laughs> Back into the kitchen, and Darren is administering a ridiculous amount of ketchup to his bacon sandwich, which is beside Denise holding a ciggy. This is a really well-constructed shot here, as behind Denise is Barb holding her cig up in the same fashion, like mother, like daughter. Denise and asks Darren if he can get any of those cheap cigs, but he says he can't due to his mom being fired from the offy. So even Darren's ailing mother is in on the graft. I mean, these weren't cheap cigs as they were off-duty or whatnot. I mean, it seems they were just stolen via Darren's mother, abusing her position of trust. Darren's entire family seems to be in on it then. His mother, all his brothers inside, even his Uncle Jack. Hey, Darren. What happened with your Uncle Jack's pub? Well, he got the money back off the insurance. And was it him that burnt it down? Yeah. (laughs) Darren says that, yeah, happily. And Barbara herself just kind of smiles, as if it's a nice anecdote that's been relayed, and not the tale of her son's best mate's blood relative committing some real serious insurance fraud. I mean, can you imagine that pub too? Darren's Uncle Jack's establishment. Probably make the pear trees and feathers look like somewhere in Nutsford. Dave, we notice in the living room, back in the living room, now has a can in his hand too. Sitting down below as Jim is up on the ladder holding court. Twig asks if he's a tit or a leg man, and Dave is as indecisive as ever. Jim responds by just calling him a tit head, much to his amusement. Dave just swigs and doesn't really respond. Jim then struggles at first to remember an actress he loves to see on the box. It's Helen Mirren. She's knocking on a bit, but she doesn't mind flipping him out, he says. Twig even knows the show she's on, mentioning Prime Suspect. Twig, after all, is a bit of an entertainment connoisseur, what with his love of Dale Winton and that. And Helen Mirren, that's Dame Helen Lydia Mirren. She is a recipient of numerous accolades and is the only performer to have achieved the triple crown of acting in both the United States and the United Kingdom. She received an Academy Award and a BAFTA for a betrayal of Queen Elizabeth II in The Queen, a Tony and a Laurence Olivier Award for the same role in the audience, three BAFTA TV awards for a performance as DCI Jane Tennyson in Prime Suspect, and four Primetime Emmy Awards, including two for Prime Suspect. Now, on the topic of Helen Mirren getting them out, she told the Radio Times, quote, I'm a naturist at heart. I love being on beaches where everyone is naked. Ugly people, beautiful people, old people, whatever. It's so unisexual and so liberating. In 2004, she was named Naturist of the Year by British Naturism. She said, Many thanks to British Naturism for this great honour. I do believe in naturism, and am my happiest on a nude beach with people of all ages and races. And Prime Suspect, finally. Prime Suspect being a British police procedural television drama devised by Linda LaPlante. It starred Helen Mirren as Jane Tennyson, who was one of the first female detective chief inspectors in Greater London's Met Police Service, who rose to the rank of detective superintendent, who rose to the rank of detective superintendent while confronting institutionalised sexism within the police force. There's plenty of life in them then, uh, Helen Mirren's Jim infuses as we cut to the kitchen again, where Anthony and Darren are expressing their love of someone else they admire on TV. Now you gotta tell us what is the acoustic like in here. Should we test it? Hear me now. Ride the punani. Ride the punani. Good acoustic. Booyakasha. Booyakasha. West side. West side. Class. It's more Ali G, of course, but the three women in the kitchen are looking at them like everyone else looked at Cheryl. It does seem a bit silly to do it there and quite juvenile, but they're bored and enjoying themselves, claiming it's top. We get a booyakasha from both, a west side too, and this is a new angle, so we can see here an open Pampers baby wipes box on the side, which is a nice touch. Denise wants them out though, says they should go in the lounge, but Ant rightly doesn't want that as they'll just make them help with the stripping. Denise ironically calls Ant a lazy git, which then starts a bickering back and forth. You're right, lazy git, you. No, you are. 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 You are. No, you are. You're the lazy git. Anthony. I'm a full-time mother. Man, what are you telling? Anthony. I'm a full-time mother. We've seen she's not even part-time, not even a gig economy mother, but still she uses it as a weapon. 
They then scurry off into the lounge, and you do forget in the way that it's edited that there's literally an open doorway between them. By all rights, we should have had some proper bleed between audios, but it makes sense why they didn't. Jim, as they go in, is telling the end of an anecdote which has everyone laughing. He's saying, he said, I take half of Viagra to stop pissing on my shoes, which says it all really. And, and you'll remember in Sunday dinner when Jim comes in with Twig as well, he's kind of halfway telling an anecdote and you can kind of trace your steps back to the punchline. So they greet the boys, Twiggy smiles to Darren, Jim says hi Lurkio and then hi Casanova to Darren, who doesn't quite understand this at first, furrowing his brow. But when the men start singing simply the best and boogieing a little, the penny drops. And they're in full song here. And we can see Ant singing too, pointing at him, laughing loudly. It's a whole Tina Turner session at this point, with them jumping into another classic in Private Dancer, one that Dave initiates. They can't help themselves here, and how could you? I mean, what a funny way to get into it. Not just telling Darren, oh, we heard that you're with B. Julie from Argos, but jumping into a whole songbook of her lookalike. Darren is just there taking it. I love the shot of him standing solidly in front of these free tenors. And Jim, Jim then concludes the episode with the obvious joke and the coup de gras. Hey, 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 have you seen their nut bush city limits? <laughs> nut bush city limits being obviously an early Tina and Ike song, but also a slightly gauche inference to the vaginal, with Jim making his point clear by finally using the spatula for some good by slapping his crotch. Darren at this point can only laugh to himself. I mean, Andrew Wyman, amazing performance here, perfect performance. You know, that type of laughter where you've cracked, where you just can't help yourself. I mean, there's a ton in every one, but this in particular. And uh, there we go. The episode ends. It's a few minutes shorter than the standard episodes. I mean, I guess there's less TV and silences to stretch it out. I mean, not that that's padding or anything. But, you know, this is one of the more compact offerings still, with eight characters together across two small sets. And it's just as miraculous as ever. All right, guys, and there we have it. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts there on decorating. As always, if you enjoy the show, there are many ways you can give back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter. You can send us an email, therawramblepod at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you on your thoughts on decorating or how you got into the show or just anything in general, Raw Family based. You know, get in touch with me there iTunes is there, Spotify is there, all the various RSS feeds, you'll be able to find us. Patreon as well. If you enjoy the show, you want to give back to the show, and you want to listen to Elsie's funeral right now, you can't wait a month, go support us on the Patreon. That is greatly, greatly appreciated. And um, yeah, that kind of wraps us up. Until next month, I'm sure I'll see you before then as well. Maybe we'll do a quiz episode or something like that. Go back through the archive, check out all the old episodes. Shout out to everyone involved with making this show. I mean, this episode we've just discussed is 22, almost 22 years old now at this point, and it hasn't lost a step. It is still a true masterpiece. And uh, yeah, until next time, listen to the Mumbo number five. Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble, an episode by episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com.